Good morning, good afternoon, good evening all. A very warm welcome on behalf of the IAPD events team. We very much look forward to supporting you with today's Strengthening Capacities and Technical Acumen webinar series, with today's webinar focusing on corneal blindness and eye banking. I am now delighted to hang, hand over to Dr. Gurang to welcome you to the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. I would like to welcome you all to this webinar, Strengthening Capacities and Technical Acumen on Corneal Blindness and Eye Banking, which is most likely is close to our hearts. I'm Rita Gurung. I work as a cornea specialist in the Lunga Institute of Ophthalmology in Kathmandu. Next, please. So as we all know, corneal blindness, corneal disease is the second most frequent cause of blindness in many developing countries, including countries in Southeast Asia. The important causes include corneal infection, trachoma, trauma, nutritional deficiency, iatrogenic sometimes, and dystrophies and degenerations to some extent. But ha having said that, in many countries, including in countries in Southeast Asia, trachoma has been eliminated as public health problem. Nutritional deficiency, especially the vitamin D deficiency is handled by the Ministry of Health and Population in many countries with very strong vitamin A supplementation programs. So now corneal infection remains the main cause of blindness in corneal. As you, as you can see in this slide, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the incidence of corneal ulcer is different in different countries, although this, uh, this uh, data is old, but uh, it is still very relevant. The corneal ulcer prevalent, um, incidence is 11 per 100,000 population in, in the US and 130 in South India and 700 in 100,000 population in Nepal. So we, next please, last one. So um, many of these um, corneal blind people are very young people. So when they are blind, it, it affects their economy as the individual of that family and as the, of the nation as a whole. So management of corneal blindness includes mainly prevention at the primary level. That's what I think. And in Southeast Asia, there have been very many very good studies like the Bhaktapur Eye study, which was done many years ago in Nepal. There was corneal ulceration studies in uh, Southeast Asia, one, two, and three, in Bhutan, Burma, and South India. Next, please. So all those uh, studies has, have given us a very strong evidence that we can prevent corneal ulcer by just putting antibiotic as prophylaxis. And in this region, there were lots of good studies on primary prevention of ocular injury in agricultural workers with some safety gear. So they, uh, if we do miss this boat, then the treatment of corneal infection comes to the corneal specialist mainly, but it can go to any ophthalmology, which is very difficult to treat, and it, it bears a very higher and longer morbidity. And if we can, if we are lucky, and if we can salvage, salvage the eye, the vision restoration with corneal transplantation in tertiary level care is available in many countries. But corneal transplantation has got its own complexities. Next, please. So the objective of this webinar is to familiarize the stakeholders with the current uh, prevalence of corneal disease discuss the required program aimed at preventive and curative care of corneal diseases and the blindness. Next, please. So to meet this um, objective, we, have, we will have four presentations. Burden of corneal blindness globally in Southeast Asia region. Second will be evidence-based strategic management of corneal blindness. Third is going to be infrastructure and health workforce assessment to eliminate corneal blindness. And at the end, we'll have case study models and cross learning across states and nations. So can we have the first presentation, please? Hello, everyone. I am Sunita Chaurasia, consultant in cornea and anterior segment services at LV Prasad Eye Institute and medical director associated with Ramayama International Eye Bank. 
My colleagues and I welcome you all to this session focused on corneal blindness and eye banking in Southeast Asia region. I begin with my talk on the burden of corneal blindness in Southeast Asia. This slide shows the WHO classification system used to categorize the severity of blindness and visual impairment. Global estimates show that a total of 253 million persons are blind and or are vision impaired worldwide. The prevalence of blindness and of moderate to severe visual impairment is highest in South Asia as compared to other regions of the world. South Asia includes 32.65% of the worldwide blind individuals, 28.25% with moderate to severe visual impairment and 26.73% of the individuals with mild visual impairment. Uh, diseases affecting the cornea are the major cause of blindness worldwide, second only to cataract. A prevalence study from 2015 showed that of the 4.2 million corneal blind, 2.6 million live in East, South and Southeast Asian countries. In a recent meta-analysis on corneal blindness in Asia, the prevalence of moderate to severe visual impairment and blindness due to corneal diseases in Asia was estimated at 0.38%. South Asia has a prevalence of blindness slightly higher than Central Asia. India has the highest prevalence and Sri Lanka has the lowest. The regions having high prevalence of corneal blindness also have other health conditions related to poverty, water scarcity, poor sanitation, harsh climate and unhospitable geography. The age standardized prevalence of blindness and moderate to severe visual impairment is lower for men as compared to women. The reasons for this gender disparity are likely due to differences in the access to medical services and to somewhat longer longevity of women. Blindness and visual impairment not only affect the quality of life of the individual and their family, but also impact the socio-economic order of the nations in many ways. The causes of corneal blindness encompass a wide variety of infective and non-infective diseases that cause corneal scarring, which ultimately lead to functional blindness. In the APID study conducted between 1996 to 2000, the prevalence of blindness was 1.84%. 7% was due to corneal diseases. Keratitis and trauma were the commonest causes of corneal blindness in this population. The Chennai Eye Disease Incident Study in Rural and Urban South India, published in 2015, reported a 6-year blindness incidence of 0.48% and 3.2% for monocular blindness in those above 40 years of age. The incident monocular blindness was higher in rural than in urban population. In this study, corneal pathologies accounted for 3% of monocular blindness. The leading risk factors for corneal blindness were age, rural residence, and history of cataract surgery. Post-cataract surgery corneal decompensation accounted for 9.5% of blindness and 4.5% of monocular blindness. The Corneal Opacity Rural Epidemiological Survey in North India in 2015 reported a corneal disease prevalence of 3.7% with 0.12 prevalence of corneal blindness. The leading cause of bilateral corneal blindness was again post-cataract surgery bullous keratopathy, showing the relationship of delayed or inadequate management of cataract surgery with corneal blindness. In the more recent report of National Blindness and Visual Impairment Survey, from India that represented 31 districts, corneal blindness was the second leading cause of blindness in India. Trachoma was one of the leading causes of blindness in India in the past, but in the last decade, prevalence and rapid assessment surveys conducted all over the country provided concrete evidence that trachoma is no longer a public health problem in the country. In the Nepal Pediatric Ocular Disease Study, Corneal opacity was the most common cause of unilateral blindness. As corneal grafting is the principal surgery for corneal blindness, corneal transplantation statistics are a proxy measure that help to determine the nation's means of addressing the problem of corneal blindness. This picture here shows the size of countries with respect to the population of corneal blind. The color scheme in the picture reflects upon the country's readiness for eye banking and corneal transplantation. The purple represents high, blue represents medium to high, green represents medium to low, and yellow represents low readiness. 
The various Southeast Asian countries fall into each of the four categories where India shows a markedly high readiness to corneal transplantation. This world map shows the supply and demand of corneal transplantation across 148 countries. As per the survey, Sri Lanka is an exporter of cornea. India's status is almost sufficient, but many other countries are either not sufficient or are in embryonic category. The management of corneal blindness primarily revolves around corneal transplantation, either partial or full thickness based upon the clinical condition. In countries with a well-established eye bank such as USA and Europe, the indications of corneal transplantation data may be able to give a sound measure of burden of corneal diseases amenable to transplants. However, in those countries with an insufficient and embryonic eye banking facilities, the indications of transplants are not an exceptionally reliable surrogate measure of the burden and etiology of corneal blindness in the community. The etiology of corneal blindness and indications of transplants, although related, are somewhat mutually exclusive across the nations, and so the epidemiology of the two should ideally be interpreted independently. Secondly, most reports of corneal blindness are of people above 40 years of age. The major causes of corneal blindness in children include xerophthalmia, ophthalmia neonatorum, herpes simplex keratitis, and chemical keratitis. There is an underrepresentation of corneal diseases in children and young adults. This slide shows some of the relevant references on this topic. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sunita. Um, now I would like to introduce Dr. Sudhir. Dr. Adar Sudhir is the head of the Department of Preventive Ophthalmology. He is the senior cornea consultant and head of medical uh, information in Shankara Netralai, Chennai, India. Please, Dr. Sudhir. My name is Dr. Adar Sudhir. I head the Department of Preventive Ophthalmology and I'm a senior consultant at cornea and refractive services at Shankara Netralia. Medical Research Foundation, Chennai, India. I'll be talking to you on evidence-based and strategic management of corneal blindness. As we all know, 4.5 million people have moderate to severe vision impairment, secondary to loss of corneal clarity. Good news is 80% of these corneal blindness is avoidable. On the other hand, it affects younger population, hence disability-adjusted life years are much greater in this segment of people. Only one in 70 individuals with treatable corneal blindness ultimately undergo surgery because of multitude of region-specific social, economic, and political factors. Greater burden is in developing countries, but most corneal transplants are performed in developed countries. As we all know, there are different levels of evidence available, the highest level of evidence being systematic reviews and randomized control trials. In the management of corneal blindness, there are plenty of studies which are available, randomized control studies which are available in the management of corneal blindness, like vitamin A prophylaxis, uh, treatment of trachoma through various randomized control protocols of safe protocols, systematic review on risk factors, longitudinal studies on natural progression of the disease, and randomized control trials in the treatment of microbial keratitis with various antibiotic or antifungal protocols, and plenty of studies available in operational research in identifying the, the best method for management of corneal blindness. I will be highlighting the strategies in the management under the broad etiological classification as given here. And I will also be covering them under the different levels of, uh, levels of prevention. The primary prevention under the heading, primary prevention is where we aim to prevent the disease or injury before it occurs by various methods like vaccination in, in case of uh, measles infection, vitamin A prophylaxis, in case of uh, vitamin A deficiency, perinatal care and essential newborn care, the management of ophthalmia neonatorum, and uh, environmental hygiene in trachoma, and safe practices in prevention of ocular trauma, and preventing use of harmful traditional eye medication remedies which can lead to corneal blindness. All these come under the primary prevention. Coming on to the secondary prevention is basically one need to try to detect a disease early and prevent it from getting it worse. So in the management of treatment of ulcers, early referral to higher centers when the microbial keratitis is not responding, 
and there are uh, new protocols on the community level prophylaxis which have shown good outcomes in Nepal, India, Bhutan and Myanmar where community workers actively ensure the villages receive topical antimicrobial ointment within 18 hours of corneal abrasion whenever there is an injury to the eye. And each study suggested the incidence of ulcers have reduced more than 80%. Under secondary prevention, we also have first tra training and initial management of trauma in case of uh, uh, chemical injuries at workplace. Coming on to the tertiary prevention, it focuses on people who are already affected by a disease. The goal is to improve the quality of life by reducing disability, limiting or delaying complications and restoring function. And in this regard, we will discuss the eye banking and keratoplasty. Uh, in this map, which shows the size of the country, in this map reflects the population of corneal blinds and color represents the readiness for corneal transplant. India emerges as a clear global priority with the largest corneal blind population and also have a strong infrastructural readiness for handling them. Whereas the African countries and South Asian countries uh, uh, have higher estimates of corneal blindness and low readiness for handling these scenarios. Going to each scenario like the infectious keratitis, there's a great disparity in the incidence of infectious keratitis between West and developing countries. As we all know, the prompt diagnosis and early referral and better initial management before extensive damage to the cornea plays a major role in prevention of vision loss due to infectious keratitis. And secondary prevention measures like treating the abrasions which we discussed earlier. And this can be achieved by following stipulated guidelines on management at various levels of eye care, immediate referral on presentation if the patient is one-eyed, child, or if there is a perforation, improving training of all stakeholders in the management of peripheral, in the management of microbial keratitis in early diagnosis and in the management of the disease. The other most important cause is a pseudophagic bellus keratopathy, which is other major cause which occurs because of increase in cataract blindness, increase in the number of cataract surgeries are performed and uh, by uh, in, all over, in all the countries. And if there are poor outcomes because of inadequate training of surgeons, this can be solved with good cataract surgical training. Diagnosing people at risk of endothelial cell loss or a complicated cases which has to be managed by well-trained surgeons will decrease the incidence and management by trained surgeons for lamellar keratoplasty procedures will reduce the burden from bullous keratopathy. Ocular trauma accounts for one third of all the cases of corneal blindness and most of it is work-related interventions needs to be done in the form of safety goggles and safety campaigns and training of junior ophthalmologist in the management of orbital trauma along with training in cataract should be the part of the curriculum. And whenever there is a trauma multidisciplinary approach in complicated cases and unsupervised repair of traumatized eyes by inexperienced surgeons should be strongly discouraged. These are some of the guidance which have been put forward by the ophthalmic trauma risk and management update. As far as the trachoma is concerned, as, as of 10th September 2020, 13 countries have reported achieving elimination goals. Trachoma is almost eliminated in all the CRO countries other than India. Prevention and re-emergence and continuous safe uh, protocols in these uh, hyperendemic areas or wherever there is a re-emergence of trachoma. IEC in high burden areas aimed at safe components, which is the surgery, antibiotic, face wash, and uh, environmental cleanliness. Community-based case finding of patients with trachoma trichiasis and treating them will prevent corneal blindness. Coming on to the eye banking, diff there is high difference in eye banking trajectories in various countries. It has been proposed to have a three-tier community eye banking system with eye donation centers, eye banks, and at a higher level as eye banking training centers, which are responsible for tissue harvesting, processing, and distribution, creating public awareness, as well as training and skill upgradation of eye banking personnel and surgeons. EDC should be available at the sub-district level for every FILAC population, and one I bank per 5 million population is the target set by Vision 2020. National Program for Control of Blindness in India has, is providing a financial support for strengthening eye banks in the form of non-recurring and recurring grant, which helped in improvement of eye banking in India. Coming on to the uh, cornea retrieval programs, 
the hospital corneal retrieval program in comparison to the voluntary corneal retrieval program has been a game changer in increasing the collection, active counseling of relatives in the hospital after death by grief counselor. This also gives easy accessibility of potential donors, availability of tissue from young donors, reduction of death to corneal retrieval time, cost effectiveness in procuring the corneas, and this is included as a strategy under NPCB. So you can see the graph here from one of the uh, Ramayama International Eye Bank, which showed the voluntary versus uh, motivated collection. From 2010, the growth of the HASP CP has increased the number of corneas which have been collected through HRCP program. Coming on to storage, distribution, and utilization of tissue, adaptation of longer preservation media in eye banks will help in reducing the discard rates and readiness for times of corneal shortage, especially where eye banking is in recent stage, overcoming challenges of demand and supply by better networking, gratis corneas when surplus, where one nation can donate to the other nation when they have a surplus of corneas, Transnational cornea supply network to reduce the wastage of corneas will help in better distribution. Expertise on various methods of keratoplasty, emphasis on training, optimal utilization of donor corneas by focus on component corneal surgeries will also improve the better utilization of the tissue. Coming on to the eye donation, the awareness, eye banking awareness studies show the illiteracy and rural dwelling are the strong predictors of poor awareness. Uh, there was a wide difference between rural and urban awareness about eye donation. There is a negative correlation in the relationship between the donors and those people who have pledged. This, however, there is increased awareness in healthcare worker families and uh, one need to have methods to improve these awareness for eye donation, so which will help in better uh, voluntary donation and HRCP collection. To improve the awareness, eye banking uh, like National Eye Donation Fortnight was introduced in India, which observes every year, 25th August to 8th September. The campaigns which aims to create mass public awareness and to pledge their eyes for donation after that. Uh, many celebrities have volunteered to be site ambassadors in this campaign, and which you can see that from the Eye Bank Association of India, which is helping in spreading the awareness among the population. So, to summarize, corneal blindness as a challenge addressed by both prevention efforts and treatment efforts, contribution from a variety of sources, including public health workers, patient advocates, government leaders, physicians, and community workers. One need to improve the awareness of corneal disease, protection from ocular trauma, avoiding home remedial measures, increasing eye donation awareness, better training of human resources and all stakeholders involved in the management of corneal blindness, reducing the gaps between the demand and supply of corneal tissues and effective utilization by networking and improving the eye bank infrastructure will help in managing corneal blindness. Thank you. And I'll be happy to take questions and uh, you can reach me at this email. Thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Sudhir. Now we'll move on to the third uh, presentation. This presentation is by Dr. Vivek Gupta. And Dr. Vivek Gupta is the Associate Professor of Community Ophthalmology in RP Center, AIMS, New Delhi, India. He has a public health uh, background with involvement in many surveys like National Blindness and Visual Impairment Service, Trachoma Service, and, and many more surveys. And he will be talking on infrastructure and health workforce assessment to eliminate corneal blindness. Hello, myself, Dr. Vivek Gupta, and I will be discussing about infrastructure, workforce assessment, and needs to eliminate corneal blindness in our country. An improved understanding of the magnitude of eye care needs that are currently being met as well as unmet by the health system is critical for effective planning of healthcare resources and infrastructure. Population eye care needs describes the volume and type of need for eye care from all individuals within a given population. It includes the need for eye care across all health strategies, including health promotion, prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation. We can apply the same generic principles to corneal opacities. Health promotion activities for corneal opacities include public health education activities for prevention of injuries and infections such as trachoma. 
These also include promotion of eye protective behaviors. An example would be the use of protective eyewear by farmers to reduce agricultural eye injuries. Specific prevention activities aim to curtail causes and risk factors for corneal opacities and corneal blindness. These would include implementation of safe strategy for trachoma, vitamin A supplementation, measles or MMR vaccination as components of universal immunization program, as well as policy level changes, such as restricting use of fireworks. Safe strategy for trachoma includes surgery, antibiotics, facial hygiene, and environmental hygiene. Since trachoma has been eliminated in many countries of Southeast Asia region, and active trachoma has been eliminated in India based on the recent trachoma assessment surveys, mass drug administration for trachoma is not required. However, other preventative and therapeutic components of the SAFE strategy should still be implemented. Especially important here is making provisions for management of trachomatous trichiasis through surgery in affected districts, which in turn can prevent development of trachomatous corneal opacities and corneal blindness due to trachoma. Tertiary prevention deals with early diagnosis and treatment. Some of the interventions in this category include early identification, management, and referral for ocular injuries, as well as case finding and treatment of corneal opacities through keratoplasty and eye banking services. Finally, the importance of rehabilitative interventions for persons with corneal blindness cannot be overstated. Low vision and rehabilitative interventions aim to optimize the everyday functioning of those with visual impairment and blindness that cannot be treated in their environment by maximizing the use of residual vision and providing practical adaptations to address the social, psychological, emotional, and economic consequences of vision impairment. Since low vision services are being covered in a separate module, these will not be touched upon further here. Data on population needs for eye care are essential for planning eye care services as part of universal health coverage. These data can be best achieved from population-based surveys. To strengthen data collection, these surveys need to be an integral part of health information systems. Population-based surveys not only need to provide information on both unmet and unmet needs for eye care, they must also allow for disaggregating results for subpopulations such as women, ethnic minor minorities, and indigenous groups. This information should drive eye care planning to reduce inequalities. Overall priorities should be determined based on population needs and should not be determined on an ad hoc basis according to non-transparent factors such as visibility of certain conditions, a professional scope of practice, or priorities of development partners or funding bodies. Community consultations also provide an important source of information on eye care needs of population. Consultations are a concrete way in which public can be engaged in the development of national health plans that ultimately affect them and where they can provide feedback. These consultations improve accountability and transparency and increase the sense of ownership and engagement of the population, especially marginalized groups, transforming them into active stakeholders. We can use the estimates of corneal opacities associated with moderate severe visual impairment to arrive at approximate number of population need. At a broad level, we can use the multi-country slash regional estimates given by the Vision Loss Expert Group and published in the Lancet Global Health in 2017. Here we use the estimated prevalence for the South Asia as well as Southeast Asia regions to arrive at burden per million or per 10 lakh population. Broadly, these numbers translate to approximately 400 to 700 individuals who have moderate severe visual impairment due to corneal opacities and an additional 300 to 1300 individuals who have blindness on account of corneal opacities per million population. As we can see, there is also a wide range of uncertainty in these estimates. This is an example of arriving at an estimated numbers using results from National Blindness Survey in India that was conducted using RAB6 methodology. We start by estimating the number of persons aged 50 plus years and 0 to 50 years in a population using the census reported data. Then we estimated the prevalence of visual impairing and blinding corneal opacities by multiplying the prevalence of moderate severe visual impairment and blindness with the proportion of 
MSVI and blindness due to corneal opacities. Then we multiply the prevalence of visually impairing and blinding corneal opacities with the population sizes in each group to arrive at the estimated number of persons visually impaired and blind due to corneal opacities in each group. Uniocular corneal opacities do not cause blindness or visual impairment but need to be treated. Blindness surveys such as RAV will often miss on the number of individuals who have unilateral corneal involvement. In such a scenario, the number affected by unilateral corneal blindness can be estimated as approximately five times the number of bilaterally corneally blind. Here also we add the burden of uniocular blindness due to corneal opacity as five times the burden of binocular blindness. Finally, we add the numbers in each age group to arrive at the total burden per million population. Specially designed studies focused on corneal opacity may be utilized for gathering information on exact needs. An example of such study is the core study done in rural North India, which revealed that while the overall prevalence of corneal opacity was 3.7%, corneal blindness was present in 0.12% of population and one third of the participants with corneal opacity had bilateral involvement. In general, the more specific the estimate, the better it is. But majority of times, data from local district level corneal surveys will not be available. In such scenarios, techniques described previously using national surveys or regional multi-country estimates may be used to arrive at a reasonable approximation of population needs for corneal blindness and visual impairment. The other important aspect of needs assessment is to assess the kind of infrastructure that is needed for eye banking services in the country. These form one of the mainstays of current interventions to manage persons who have developed corneal opacities. I'll be taking the example of Indian standards and these can serve as the basis for planning with local modifications. Well, a tiered system of eye banking is recommended. At the top, we have the eye bank training centers which are located in regional institutes of ophthalmology. These impart training and certification to ophthalmologists. These are followed by eye banks in major medical colleges and tertiary eye care centers. These eye banks and eye bank training centers are networked with eye donation or retrieval centers. All large hospitals and metros with mortality rate of more than 50 per month should be set up as eye donation or retrieval centers and linked to the nearest eye bank. Here we list the nature of human resources that are required at various levels of eye banking system. These include board of directors, medical director, in charge director, an executive director or a manager, an eye bank technician, and eye bank counselors. Multiple responsibilities may be delegated to one person as appropriate, and it is important that a medical director must be an ophthalmologist who has completed a corneal fellowship or has demonstrated expertise in external eye disease, corneal surgery, research, or teaching in cornea and or external disease of the eye and has experience in corneal transplantation. There would not be much purpose of eye banking if there are insufficient number of keratoplasty centers. Additionally, follow-up services for patients who have undergone keratoplasty should be made available not just at keratoplasty centers, but also at other eye care facilities. A keratoplasty center should have an ophthalmic surgeon trained in keratoplasty. It is recommended that each medical college eye bank and eye bank training center should also function as a keratoplasty center. In 2015, India's national program had estimated a national requirement of 1,000 trained keratoplasty surgeons. Furthermore, all district ophthalmic surgeons should be trained in management of patients with corneal crafts. This would amount to approximately one surgeon providing follow-up services per one to two million population. As an example, for 50 million slash 5 crore population, we would need one eye bank training center at the rate of 1 per 50 million population, 10 eye banks at the rate of 1 per 5 million population, 100 eye donation centers at the rate of 1 per 0 0.5 million population, 25 trained keratoplasty surgeons at the rate of 1 per 2 million population, and 50 trained district ophthalmic surgeons at the rate of 1 per million population. Each eye bank training center and eye retrieval center must also have 
various equipment and facilities to perform the volume of laboratory services with optimal accuracy, efficiency, sterility, timeliness and safety. Provisions must be made for monitoring functioning of all equipment, temperature recordings in refrigerator, calibrations, cleaning, etc. as per the recommended standards. Adequate sterile instruments must be made available to provide for aseptic retrieval of whole eye and corneas. These must be made available at all three levels of the eye banking infrastructure. Here we list the recommended types of instruments in corneal excision sets and enucleation sets. Sufficient number of these sets must be available at the centers based on the needs assessment of retrievals as well as keratoplasties. The laboratories should be separate areas with limited access in which activities directly related to tissue processing are carried out. Three types of laboratories are needed, serology lab, tissue processing lab, and finally instrument cleaning and storage area. All must be present in iBank training centers, while iBank must also have access to a serology lab. At eye retrieval centers, instrument cleaning and storage areas are recommended. In addition, various support facilities should be available at each of these centers. These include forms used during activities such as pledging, donation, enrolling a client, etc., logs, registers, and MIS for monitoring the program, health education and awareness resources such as posters, pamphlets, transportation facility, telecommunications facility, air conditioning, and various utilities. It is to be noted that for all preventative and promotive activities, the current health system of the country must be leveraged for implementation of activities. This would mean involving the ASHA workers, the medical officers, the ophthalmic assistants and optometrists who are located at the community level, primary healthcare centers, vision centers and CHCs. They have a critical role to play in health education, case identification, referral, early first aid of corneal injuries, and follow-up of patients who have undergone keratoplasty. With this, I would like to conclude my talk. In the talk, we have covered the various levels of interventions for corneal opacities, the assessment of population needs for corneal blindness and corneal opacities, assessment of infrastructure and human resources for managing corneal opacities and corneal blindness, in a community. I thank Professor Praveen Vashisht, Dr. Nupur Gupta and Dr. Suraj Senjam, my colleagues whose inputs went into preparation of these talk. In case of any queries, I may be contacted at vgupta at the red aims for TDU. I thank you for your patient listening. Have a good day. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Vivek, for such a wonderful and very detailed um, planning of especially the eye bank. Um, I would like to remind all the um, all the listeners or audiences to use your Q&A button to put any questions you have so that we can get the answers from the panelists in, uh, in due course. Thank you so much. Now I would like to um, present, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Manpreet Kaur, who is a um, assistant professor Cornea Cataract and Refractive Surgery Services at Rajendra Prasad um, uh, Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, Ames, New Delhi. And she will be presenting on case study models and cross learning across states and nations. Dr. Manpreet. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Manpreet Kaur, Assistant Professor, Cornea Cataract and Refractive Surgery Services. RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, Ames, New Delhi, India. I will be discussing case study models and cross-learning across states and nations. I have no relevant financial disclosures. The approach to eliminating corneal blindness has three aspects, namely prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation. The WHO Alliance for the Global Elimination of Trachoma is one of the most successful models for prevention of avoidable blindness. A safe strategy has been adopted in the affected nations consisting of surgery, antibiotics, facial cleanliness and environmental modifications in an attempt to prevent trachoma transmission and manage the chronic disease sequelae. 
It is a collaborative success story with over 13 countries reporting elimination of trachoma. India has been declared free of active trachoma in 2017. Corneal injury is a leading cause of avoidable blindness and the Sight Life Awareness and Prevention Program is a pilot program instituted in rural Nepal and India that empowers the community health workers to treat corneal trauma. It's based on the principle that prompt antibiotic treatment within 24 hours can prevent blinding sequelae. Prior to the institution of this program, patients with corneal injury needed to travel to a regional health center, often on foot, leading to an average delay in presentation of up to 8 days. This led to three times increased incidence of need for transplant and a fourfold increase in blindness. This novel approach by Sight Life focuses on educating the caregivers in local communities and providing inexpensive antibiotic treatment in an attempt to prevent blindness due to corneal injury. The National Vitamin A Prophylaxis Program in India is another example of successful prevention of avoidable corneal blindness due to keratomalacia. The program focuses on prevention of vitamin A deficiency by promoting consumption of vitamin A rich food, promoting awareness amongst the general public, and supplementation of vitamin A for preschool children as a part of the national immunization program wherein they are administered 9 mega doses of vitamin A up to 5 years. In addition, children with vitamin A deficiency, measles or malnutrition are appropriately treated at health facilities to prevent keratomalacia sequelae and treat dry eyes. Treatment of corneal blindness is intricately linked to the development of successful eye banking models in various countries. There are several barriers to establishing an effective eye banking system in Southeast Asia, including the shortage of optimal quality donor tissue, lack of adequate skilled surgeons and technicians, non-affordability of equipment and culture media involved in tissue processing and storage, and inadequate public awareness. In the subsequent presentation, We'll look at various nations and states that have managed to overcome these challenges and how we may apply their models in Southeast Asian countries to further the cause of eliminating corneal blindness. If we look at the global trends, corneal transplants are performed by over 116 nations. However, only USA and Sri Lanka managed to export donor corneas to other countries in significant numbers. Let us have a detailed look at the eye banking models in these nations. The Sri Lanka Eye Donation Society was established in 1961 by Deshbandhu Dr. Hudson Silva. It is a non-governmental, non-profit organization involved in donating human eyes and tissues for transplantation. The society provides the tissues free of charge with only a small processing fee. Sri Lanka is one of the largest corner providers in the world. This small country owes its success to the cultural background with the Buddhist concept of dan or giving ingrained in its population. Over 70% of the Sri Lankan population consists of Buddhists and their pro-donation culture has also seeped into the remaining sections of the population with Hindus and Christians also donating eyes via this society. In contrast to the Western world, there is no official organ donation registry and the idea of donating organs is simply passed down from generation to generation. Regular eye donation campaigns and are organized at temples by Buddhist monks and future donors can simply mail in the bottom half of a consent form distributed by Silva's Eye Donation Society. The Sri Lanka Eye Donation Society maintains the Sri Lanka International Eye Bank. The tremendous success of their program may be evidenced by the fact that Sri Lanka receives over 3,000 corneas a year. Of these, more than 2,000 are shipped abroad. The Sri Lankan citizens have first access to free corneas and there is no waiting list for eye tissue in Sri Lanka. Till date, the society has donated nearly 35,000 corneas to Sri Lankans, provided 60,000 corneas across 57 countries and amassed 900,000 pledges to donate eyes through the society. The eye banking operation in Sri Lanka is very cost effective, with total costs amounting to barely 16,000 US dollars per month. There is a skeletal paid staff of 47, with over 15,000 trained volunteers to remove donor eyes on demand. With these limited resources, Sri Lanka manages to export three times the number of corneas per capita each year as compared with USA. 
Sri Lanka has entered into collaboration with United Nations and several countries to assist patients in need of cornea transplants. The cost-effective model of Sri Lanka faces some concerns of maintaining quality at par with the ever advancing international standards in addition to management concerns. Coming to the different consent models adopted across various nations. There are two main types of donor consent protocols, opt-in or explicit consent and opt-out or presumed consent. Irrespective of the type of consent, the next of kin is significantly involved in decision making in both models of consent. In fact, Rosenblum et al. analyzed the consent models of 54 nations and observed that the wishes of next of kin are not considered in only four nations each with expressed and presumed consent respectively. The iBanking model in USA has evolved from required request in 1980s, wherein hospitals present families of all potential disease donors with the option of organ donation, to the routine notification, wherein hospitals report all deaths to regional organ provider organizations for assessment of organ donation eligibility, to the present-day model of first-person authorization, which considers primacy of the diseased documented desire to become a posthumous organ donor. This first person authorization model has accounted for an increasing proportion of recovered donors from 19% in 2007 to nearly 33% in 2010. The success of first person authorization hinges on the establishment of electronic state donor registries. More than 54% of the adult population in US are registered donors, with family members not having the right to override the wishes of the deceased regarding organ donation. The law also permits surrogates to authorize donation at the time of an individual's death, in case the individual's wishes are not known. In addition, iBanks in USA also provide surgeons with pre-cut corneal graft tissues since 2006. In 2008, more than 50% of the endothelial keratoplasty grafts were pre-cut. This shift from surgeon prepared to pre-cut tissues prepared by iBank technicians has streamlined the process of endothelial keratoplasty, reduced the operating theatre workload and led to time and cost saving for surgeons and hospitals. Brazil, on the other hand, is an example of a nation which failed to successfully implement the presumed consent model highlighting the need to tailor the legislation as per the socio-cultural milieu of the state. The shift from expressed consent to presumed consent in Brazil was met with resistance from surgeons and almost all still asked for family authorization before removing organs. There was little impact on the number of donations due to a lack of infrastructure to keep a register of recipients and notify them when an organ became available. In addition, Contrary public opinion and the fear that organs will be removed before they were clinically dead led to a rush to public offices to register themselves as non-donors. All this contributed to a reversal of the law to the previous expressed consent model within an year. Philippines has rapidly progressed from being entirely dependent on Sri Lanka and US for tissues in the early 90s to collecting and processing 50 to 60 tissues per month on their own. They owe the rapid turnaround to the introduction of the Act to Advance Corneal Transplantation Law, which is based on the presumed consent law, startup funding from iBank Foundation of the Philippines, and technical know-how acquired from the International Federation of Eye and Tissue Banks. Philippines, in contrast to Brazil, demonstrated the success of its modified presumed consent legislation. Just a brief overview of the iBanking system in India. A three-tier iBanking system has been established to maintain cost efficacy and optimal resource utilization. We have enough centers of excellence at the top. However, there are only 435 functional iBanks and iDonation centers as per the NPCB, with majority concentrated in the urban regions. Voluntary iDonation program has not achieved the desired success. A shift from voluntary system to a hospital cornea retrieval program has led to an increase in eye donation in eight eye banks from 38% to 72%. At present, HCRP contributes to over 60% of the total donor cornea collection. The National Eye Bank RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, AIMS, New Delhi, has launched a new AIMS Daily HCRP program in 2019 to capitalize on the hospital cornea retrieval program model of donor collection. 
It is a new hospital cornea retrieval program that aims to develop a consolidated, scalable, financially self-sustainable centralized state eye bank based at the National Eye Bank RP Center Ames. This network of five hospitals in Delhi, headed by the National Eye Bank, will help to meet the unmet need for donor tissue in Delhi by establishing a centralized system for streamlined collection, processing, and equitable distribution of donor tissues, creating a dedicated task force of eye bank technicians and counselors, and establishing a centralized training system of transplant surgeons. In addition, the National Eye Bank manufactures and distributes the McCary Kaufman media all over India. Less expensive corneal storage media, Cornisol, manufactured in Madurai, Tamil Nadu, is also used in India and neighboring countries and has helped to decrease the tissue storage costs by nearly 65%. The National Eye Bank also provides pre-cut tissues to other centers and is actively involved in the training of corneal surgeons, eye bank counselors, technicians and nursing staff. Ramayama International Eye Bank, LV Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad, India, also demonstrates the success of the concept of HCRP. It performs 900 to 1000 corneal transplants per year and has till date harvested over 94,000 donor corneas and performed over 52,000 transplants. Hyderabad is the only city in Asia with no waiting list for corneal transplants. In addition, the iBank manufactures and distributes MK Medium to other states and neighboring countries and trains corneal specialists and iBank personnel from around the world. In Bangladesh, a threefold increase in corneal transplantation has been observed since 2009 with an average 500 corneas transplanted per year, subsidies for low-income groups, and no waiting time. However, the eye banking in Bangladesh is dependent on imported tissues from other countries with not much efforts to increase local availability of donor cornea. This is a great hurdle for sustainability of eye banking. In contrast, the eye banking system is in Myanmar has developed in collaboration and partnership with international non-profit community-based organizations and is increasingly progressing towards self-sufficiency. The Mendeley Eye Bank program in Myanmar collaborates with LVPI India and Lions New South Wales Eye Bank Australia to develop technical know-how, surgical skills and enhance self-sufficiency. To sum up, the various lessons learned from different states and countries can be applied to strengthen the eye banking system in Southeast Asian countries. Legislation should be tailored as per the socio-cultural milieu of the nation. First-person authorization may be a useful model to promote organ donation. However, next of kin needs to be involved in the organ donation process in Southeast Asia. Electronic registries are essential for the success of this model. Cost effectiveness may be promoted by in-house manufacturing or storage media and exploration of cheaper cost effective alternatives. Awareness is the key to promote organ donation and a shift from voluntary to hospital cornea retrieval program based model may be useful for the Southeast Asian nations. Adequate skill and expertise may be developed by training surgeons and technicians and promoting the use of pre-cut tissues to facilitate advanced lamellar keratoplasty techniques. Thank you. Now, um, I again want to remind you all that there is a Q&A button. You can put your questions in that so that you can have your answers from our expert group. So now I'm going to um, introduce my panel, consists of six very eminent corneal surgeons of the region. Um, first, would be Dr. Suzata Das. Dr. Suzata Das is a senior cornea faculty in uh, LVP Eye Institute in Bhuvaneshwar with special interest in corneal infection and eye banking. And she has network of eye banks in LVP. Dr. Suzata, welcome as a panel. Uh, my second panelist is uh, Dr. Sanjay Singh. Dr. Sanjay Singh, my friend and colleague, is the professor of ophthalmology in National Academy of Medical Sciences, Kathmandu. He's currently heading Eastern Regional Eye Care Program in Nepal. He's the chief of cornea and refractive services in Viratnagar Eye Hospital, which is one of the biggest eye hospitals in the country. And he is one of the member uh, advisors to Nepal Eye Bank. Thank you, Sanjay, for Thank being you, here. Thank you, ma'am. Now I would like to welcome Dr. Mangala Gamage. She is 
from Sri Lanka. She's a consultant ophthalmologist with special interest in community ophthalmology. She is from, um, she is now attached to Nova Loka Hospital in Colombo. She is the chairperson of board of study in ophthalmology and past president of College of Ophthalmology of Sri Lanka. At present, she is national coordinator of Vision 2020 program in Sri Lanka. Welcome Dr. Mangala and thank you for being here. Uh, the next panelist is Dr. Asraful Haq, consultant anti-segment surgeon at Bangladesh Eye Hospital and Institute. He is the executive director at Bangladesh Eyesight Foundation. Now I uh, introduce and welcome Dr. Suzaya Singh from Malaysia. She is the senior lecturer and cornea consultant at the University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur. She leads the corneal transplant unit in the University of Malaya and is also one of the expert panel for the National Transplant Registry of Malaysia. Uh, good welcome evening, Dr. everyone. Suzaya. Thank you. Good evening. And at the end, I would like to introduce Dr. Namrata Sharma, who doesn't need any introduction at the, actually, but she is the professor of ophthalmology in the Arthur Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, Ames, New Delhi. She's the secretary of AIOS and iBank Association of India. Dr. Namrata, welcome as a panel. And I again encourage everybody to do what questions in the Q&A button down below, please. Right. Thank you, everybody. Can everybody put their camera on so that we can see you all, please. So I still do not have any, any questions in the Q&A button, but uh, I had a, a kind of a question from Dr. S uh, Dr. Sunita, whether there are any studies being done in Nepal, Bangladesh, or Malaysia about the prevalence of PBK. Does anybody have any question, panelists, please? As far as I know, maybe Dr. Sanjay might uh, uh, answer this question from Nepal side. As far as I know, I, I do not know whether we have any any studies done along that line, the prevalence of post cataract surgery, PBK. Anything, Dr. Asharaf, Asharaful Hart or Dr. Suzaya, any, anything you can say about this in your countries? Yes, can I ask from Nepal, man? Yes. Yes, actually in Nepal, like after introduction of uh, FACO surgery, like more and more young, generation of ophthalmologists, like they are learning the fever surgery. And during the learning process, like we are seeing quite a good number of cases with the pseudopathic bulloscarotopathy. But actually, that is just the clinical evidence is like we don't have any study that is showing like what is the prevalence of this uh, pseudopathic bulloscarotopathy at the moment, like after the fever surgery. Yeah, I uh, in Malaysia also, we, uh, we have a similar experience. Uh, in our clinical practice, we have seen a significant increase in the number of lamellar keratoplasties, but unfortunately, we do not have any study that actually outlines the incidence of PBK in the recent years. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, for yeah. Bangladesh, madam, also. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing lots of cases of the PBK, but the thing is that stuff. Adi is not published yet, but we are still keeping the data. As uh, Dr. Hak and Dr. Singh getting the tissue from our eye bank, Nepal eye bank. So um, our eye bank now um, supplies with uh, pre-cut tissue as well. So a uh, few of you are getting pre-cut tissue from uh, Nepal eye bank. So let's start. Uh, I still do not have any question in the Q&A button. So let's start from Dr. Sanjay, Dr. Sanjay, okay. from the um, from the presentations, we know now that the 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 corneal ulcer is the main cause of corneal blindness in developing countries, and Southeast Asia is not the exception. And as we saw in the presentations, that Nepal has the almost the highest number of 
incidence of corneal ulcers in the per um, 100,000 population in the country. So what do you think? What strategies should we be, should we be taking to reduce the corneal ulcer in Nepal? Please, Dr. Sanjay. Ma'am, like Nepal has the highest, highest incidence of corneal ulcers. Yes, actually Nepal has the highest incidence of corneal ulcers and reported in the world. Yeah. It is nearly seven times more than what was reported in South India and 70 times more than what is reported in the United States of America. And in our studies also like uh, that was published by Professor Upadhyay, we have found that uh, usually most of the patients who are affected, they are the uh, people who work in the paddy field. And while working like they sustain the minor coronal injuries or abrasions and undue delay in the treatment because of the busy agricultural season or because of the unavailability of the accessible eye care services in the nearby area, they, they're like there is some delay in getting the treatment. And during this initial crucial hours, these patients, they get infected because they are unable to apply this, uh, unable to get the treatment. So, and there is also the evidence that the several hours to sometimes like several days are required before a corneal abrasion becomes infected and goes into the corneal ulcer. So during those hours, if you are able to like apply the antibiotic uh, eye ointment, like especially in that study, like they had applied this uh, chloramphenicol eye ointment and uh, that reduced the uh, quite a lot, quite a good number of uh, corneal ulcers. So I think uh, we have to involve not only the ophthalmic manpower, like we have to involve with the other health professionals also, and we have to treat and we have to educate uh, we have to educate them and we have to train them like and they should understand the importance of applying these uh, not only the chloramphene eye ointment like any kind of eye ointment after the uh, any kind of minor bone injury sorry we lost sanjay hi sanjay so looks like uh, uh, listening to Sanjay, it is very important to put the, the uh, chloramphenicol eye ointment three times a day for several days if the patient comes to you in time. And in that study, if the patients came before 18 hours, nobody got infected, uh, infected uh, keratitis. Uh, in that study. So it's very important. But uh, as Sanjay mentioned at the end, that it is not only the ophthalmologist or the eye care personnel, but uh, we need to include our government's uh, very the smallest um, health unit, as we call it, health post in, in Nepal, and train them to use the uh, antibiotic ointment right after the, the patient sustains injury to the eye. Uh, like corneal abrasion. That's how we can we can uh, prevent having very bad corneal ulcers. Thank you, Sanjay. Although we 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 lost you, I don't know. Uh, anything like this happening in uh, in Bangladesh, Dr. Hart? No. Dr. Hart, you are muted. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Suzata. Um, so I think in Malaysia, the access to, um, to primary care is quite easy. Malaysia is a very small country and we have very good uh, healthcare system in place. But I think going in this line, one probably one thing that we face is Yes, the primary healthcare workers are aware of giving antibiotic after any trauma, but what we see is they always prescribe a combination of steroids with antibiotic. And we do face a lot of troubles because of that, because our, one of the major source of injury over here being the palm oil plantations is the, you know, the organic matter. So we yeah. do face, so I think we have, uh, you know, we are trying to emphasize that, yes, please do give antibiotics but try avoiding the combination drops with steroids. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, there is a anonymous attendee 
what do you think are the major challenges in acquiring corneas relating to COVID pandemic where many deaths could be those who had consent for donation? Uh, right. Um, after, after we had the, like, we also had, do have um, Nepal Eye Bank in, in my institute. So right after the pandemic started, the, because most of our eye banks in India and in Nepal, we are um, a conglomerate of the site life. And then we had a big uh, um, change in the protocol of the eye banking. So they changed the whole protocol. How do we go about in, in this pandemic situation? In the first wave of the pandemic, definitely we all were scared and then um, people, we, we did not get any corners. But uh, in the second uh, wave, we already had our changed protocols so that we could retrieve the corners from the dead uh, without, um, without being very uh, harmful to the staff as well as for others. So uh, even in the second wave, which was really bad in Nepal, we did not have much problem in the, in the cornea retrieval, although the number were less, but um, it was um, um, available, at least for the emergency surgeries, the cornea was available. Yes, there were some uh, patients who died and then whose um, the death, cause of death was unknown. And then if they died of COVID, obviously we didn't restrict the corneas, but others, because of the changed protocol of uh, protocol of uh, how do we do we go about in the eye banking, we retrieve the corneas. Is it same in uh, Ramayama, Sunita? Yeah, so I was just trying to uh, put the answer in the chat box as well. So if you're uh -huh. able to rule out the query related to the question, if you're able to rule out like COVID-19 is not the cause of the mortality, then certainly uh, we should go ahead with the on a donation. So that, that's, the, uh, that's the way, not to refuse just because you don't have, but certainly you should rule it out. I can just uh, pitch in Dr. Rita here in our uh, institute. We are doing RT-PCR for the donors as well as for the recipients. So unless we have a RT-PCR negative report, of course, we are taking all the precautions in the form of, you know, double contact, COVID, iodine, uh, counselors going there wearing a PPE with the face shield, with the mask, yeah. with gloves, uh, all the documents are in the laminar flow hood. They are trying to sterilize it and then, you know, washing hands frequently. Everything which is a COVID appropriate behavior is being followed. But uh, because in our institution, it's a part of a uh, other specialty institute also. And uh, so the advisory is that we have to do RT-PCR for donor also. So when our uh, technician goes there, we've trained our technicians in uh, doing the RT-PCR, the swap, the nasopharyngeal swap. So when our technician goes there, he collects the blood sample, he takes the swab report, and also uh, uh, takes the corneoscleral rim puts it into the media, and then we quarantine the tissue for 48 hours till we get the COVID RT-PCR negative for the donor. And then when it is negative, then we use it for uh, corneal transplant. So I think it will vary from uh, different institutes, in, in different institutes and different you know hospitals. Uh, so some of us are fol still following that, and others are ruling out only on the basis of history or when they're absolutely sure that it is the death is not due to COVID. So uh, now we are going towards the eye banking. Looks like uh, because that although in corneal uh, blindness the prevention is so much important, so that we do not have to do the uh, corneal transplant because corneal transplant it has its own complexities for the patients, for the surgeons, for everybody. But we do not want to go into that, but we have to, um, in life, we have to do things which we do not like to do. So I would just go to uh, Dr. Asraful Hart. 
in in Bangladesh now, um, in one of the presentation, it was uh, seen that the the um, uh, the number of transplants have gone by three, four, five folds. But uh, the you are dependent on the corneas from outside the country. You do have corneas in your, but it's very few in number. So, do you are you working on uh, something which gives you your own corneas in the future, Dr. Hart? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Am I audible? Yes, yes we're having a few uh, connection issues, but we can hear you now, Dr. Hart. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me in this session. The thing is that, ma'am, yeah, you you have told rightly that the transplantation. What if we think that uh, five to seven years before, what Dr. Manpreet is now showing excellently that now the transplantation has uh, increased in Bangladesh because of we are getting more foreign tissues. We are getting tissues from you also. Thank you for that, ma'am. And uh, our surgeons, like in 2015 or 2000, the only four corneal surgeons who can actively and transplant. Now we have 18 surgeons who are regularly transplanting because of this, but we need to have a functional eye bank. So what we are doing that right now, uh, we have six eye banks which got permission from our government and only one eye bank which is functioning from 1981 that was Shandhani. Along with Shandhani, we have now five eye banks and we focused on the voluntary donation before this time, but we are now focusing on the hospital coronary retrieval program. And hopefully uh, with all the eye banks, we can uh, make a central system for Bangladesh to motivate our patient. And if we got the permission from our authorities to go for the ACRP officially and with the local authorities, hopefully the eye banking system, we can uh, collect tissues from our local uh, fact. The religion is one of the issues, but we believe that we can overcome this issue. But uh, we're just with this COVID time, we're getting a little bit slow. Hopefully, after the pandemic has a little bit gone down, we can again work for it. And after getting the permission from our authorities for the ACRP, a functional eye bank will be established. So after that, it is a continuous process. And hopefully, we can give you an update by time to time. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. It's a similar situation in Malaysia because Bangladesh and Malaysia, because I know, because we work very closely with, uh, with Dr. Asraful and Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Singh. So it is similar situation in, uh, in Malaysia as well. Dr. Daksa, do you have any plans or are you doing something on, on the establishment or to function or to get tissue from, uh, from, from Malaysia itself? Um, uh, yes, so I, I, a lot of things I echo with what Dr. Ashraf has said, but I think in one thing we are fortunate is that uh, in the uh, surveys that we have done, we have noted that people are aware that there is no religious barrier to donation across all religion. So I think as you know, Malaysia is a multi-racial uh, country and we have uh, uh, Islam, we have Buddhism, we have Hinduism. So we have, in fact, the National Transplant Resource Center, it has put statements online on all the different religions. And as per the statements Islam, in Islam, it is they are permitted to donate and receive organs. So looking at this, we actually have started few things. In my university where I work, we have actually had a formation of an organ and tissue procurement unit. And not only in my place, but we have extended it to 16 hospitals to encourage more motivated uh, uh, donations. And we have recently introduced last year, January, a uh, ODC program, which is an organ donation innovative strategies for Southeast Asia in collaboration with the University of Barcelona. And we are now training uh, people to become full-time coordinators and just with Despite, uh, as everybody will feel that the COVID situation has, you know, dampened the cornea donation, but with the introduction of these two, we have seen almost a 150% increase in the deceased donor uh, consent rates. So yes, we are very, very new, very baby steps, but I do feel that 
we will have some better news the next time when we meet. And uh, in the meantime, thank you from the Dilganga I Bank for uh, meeting our corneal demands. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sujaya. Now, uh, as we saw in the presentation that, and, and we all know that uh, Sri Lanka has got a very successful cornea donation program, uh, thanks to Dr. Uh, Harsan Silva. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Mangala, what tips do you want to give to us in, uh, in, uh, in eye banking? Do you have any tips, Dr. Mangala? Yes, actually, now this is, of course, uh, we, you heard a lot of, a lot of things about Cornell eye banking, uh, eye banking in Sri Lanka. Uh, that is, of course, in, a, in the society wise, of course, uh, it is different in our country because we, people think that it is a meritorious act. So the, uh, people want to give, uh, donate eyes. So that is, of course, uh, it is a society uh, encouragement should be there. And uh, of course, bank uh, other facilities wise, of course, uh, there are about 400 branches uh, everywhere. Uh, and that is again to uh, that is again to promote the public, the society to uh, give adequate uh, to donate adequate uh, number of eyes. So uh, and with that of a surgery wise, of course, uh, most of the ophthalmists, uh, ophthalmists are actually trained for bony uh, grafting, different types. In addition, we have started the uh, subspecial training in cornea and external IT. They do uh, uh, a lot of work. So the surgery wise, of course, uh, also we don't have a problem as such. So I think the supply of corneas are the one that is most important, I think, uh, for you to have a good uh, eye banking system. Mm -hmm. hey, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Mangala. And, uh, Dr. Um, Sudha Das, Dr. Das, you being the uh, chair of the iBank network of uh, LB Prasad, uh, do you have anything special so that we can move forward on the, on the, on the, on the strong ground of LB Prasad's experience, please? Thanks, Dr. Rita. Uh, uh, from LB Prasad, I'll say that uh, SCRP has helped us a lot, the quality of cornea in terms of utilization. Uh, the, we should aim at a higher utilization as well as collection. More focus should be utilization. Just collecting cornea does not mean anything. So yep. we should focus more of SCRP. At the same time, we should take help of NGOs to spread awareness. Because once the awareness increases, I believe SCRP also will be easier at the consent rate will be easier. Uh, mm -hmm. then, uh, then training. Uh, training, uh, we do train uh, cornea counselors as well as technician, uh, but I still feel India need to train uh, ophthalmologist as well as eye bank technician. More, more than cornea surgeon, we need to train ophthalmologists who can take care of cornea graft because we see patients from a distance who usually cannot come for follow-up most of the time we graft because of the follow-up issue. So I feel India should be more important on uh, training. Uh, yep. Ramayama I Bank uh, trains many people in the world, but still we need many training centers, maybe in different zones, to train more people. Yes. Thank you so much. I totally agree with you, Dr. Suzaya, that we have to train our general ophthalmologists to take care of the transplants because I have seen many patients with loose suture, he goes, he, the patient goes to the general ophthalmologist and the general ophthalmologist, will, he or she will not touch the patient. They will say, okay, okay, you go to the place where you had had the transplant and they have to come to us just to take one suture out, which is, which is loose. So we have to train those ophthalmologists to care, take care of the transplant. The, just doing the transplant is easy, but taking care of the transplant is a lot more difficult and a lot more uh, time consuming and it's a long way we have to go. So we have to train and uh, we have to emphasize on the training of our ophthalmologists in taking care of the grass. I totally agree with you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to go to Dr. Namrata. Dr. Namrata, you being one of the, the, the pony surgeons, 
and working in a government owned premier institute, premier training institute of India. What do you think, what kind of policy do the government has to bring to over, overcome the corner blindness from the training perspective, from the from um, prevention perspective in, in a bigger picture way, Dr. Namrata? I think uh, as far as uh, as far as the uh, training part is concerned, we do have to train a lot more transplant surgeons. And I completely agree with Sujata. Uh, the bigger need is to train the ophthalmologists in peripheral centers so that follow-ups don't come to the transplant surgeons, but minor issues are uh, taken care of there. So that is something that needs to be done. And maybe also not only in routine surgeries, but also in uh, demilar surgeries, because that would also help you to uh, use one donor cornea for multiple recipients. And paucity of good quality donor material is a reality uh, in the entire Southeast Asia. So I think that is what is required. Uh, in, in most of the talks, so many points were highlighted. Uh, as far as the uh, corneal blindness is concerned, we need to uh, network no, not only with the eye donation centers, but also we need to network with the hospitals who have major mortality, wherever you are, whichever country you are, so that the hospital corneal retrieval program can be tapped. I think the storage media, most of us are using MK media, but COVID has taught us that you do need intermediate preservative media also, and that is again, something uh, that has to be worked. Uh, infections are a cause of uh, corneal blindness, but infections are a cause of uh, graft failure as well. And I think infections is something that uh, we need to train everybody to prevent it and to report earliest if and you know when it happens. And apart from this, I think all uh, policy changes that have to be taken is that all that take, that take place in the hospital should be mandatorily notified to the nearest type bank for eye donation. Then we should have a required request law, uh, which typically mandates that hospitals should report not only ICU deaths, but in India, ICU deaths are being notified, but even the non-ICU deaths should be notified to the eye bank. Then uh, I know that this is going to be again, country centric and country specific. But first person uh, consent decision should be, uh, you know, uh, should be legally binding and should be allowed. Uh, I really don't know whether it is possible, but telephonic consent is again, which can be uh, uh, allowed. Uh, again, access to at least this can be done uh, without any problem. And that is that access to trauma center, mortuaries uh, should be, and the uh, emergency wards where mortality rate is high, at least uh, access should be given in all the countries to those areas, to the eye bank uh, personnel, so that uh, at least that can be taken care of uh, there. And one more thing I would like to emphasize is that eye banking should be uh, not a social responsibility. As, as, as of now, it is running more as a social responsibility model rather than, you know, as a model which has to be uh, taken care of by the government or a health model at the level of the government. Government takes interest in cataract. Uh, cataract surgical rate is there, incentive on cataract is there, but that much of interest from the government side should also come on eye banking, on corneal blindness. And if, when we move from a social responsibility model to a healthcare model at the level of the government, I think that is going to make the difference. So government has to own up the responsibility for that and run it in as passionate a manner as it runs the cataract program, only then, uh, you know, uh, corneal blindness will be ameliorated from the entire Southeast Asia region. Dr. Das. I, uh, Dr. Das um, his... Yeah, I raised my hand to ask an important question that um, can we focus in our uh, work for corneal blindness to how to how to diagnose, treat, and prevent corneal blindness yes. in, in addition to or instead of uh, jumping to eye banking only. Because why do you want to have a disease and try to uh, try to treat it? So like Nepal has shown way that treating those uh, corneal abrasions uh, like uh, Dr. Sujaya Singh spoke about or palm oil thing that uh, prevents infection. X number of people don't have to go to the hospital for their eye care. 
Similarly, we do not have a clear way of diagnosing fungal infection in a rural setup, in, at least in India. They treat it all antibiotic, antifungal, antiviral example. And two, why do you land up uh, treating a patient with fungal infection? So I, when you summarize it, I will send a mail very quickly. When you summarize the WHO, please do focus also on um, treating, diagnosing, preventing fungal infection. Then only go to keratoplasty because keratoplasty is, a, I'm sorry, is a sexy thing to say and do, but then why do you want to invite it at all? I'm yes, sorry if I'm putting a, a spoke no, in no, your... No, no, perfectly, perfectly, no, no. perfectly all right, perfectly it's, all right. It's perfect because uh, when I started, we jumped to um, uh, eye banking and then we could not come out of this eye banking, but uh, uh, the prevention is the, the way forward to prevent the corneal blindness. Yes, we totally agree with you, Dr. Das. Dr. Sudhir, please. Yeah, uh, just to add upon, uh, I think uh, training more cat, uh, surgeons for corneal transplant instead of it, if we can uh, uh, take care of all the three important things is taking care of uh, identifying infections and managing by all general ophthalmologists and a good cataract surgery. That is again important because that is one of the main cause of uh, the compensation of cornea post uh, bad cataract surgery and trauma. If these three things are taken care, we need not train more corneal transplants, lamellar yeah. cataract all that is a is an upgraded one but the simple uh, answer to it is trained all in these three categories infections trauma and cataract surgery that is important coming on to awareness again uh, we being in the hospital we see a lot of uh, and we treat patients if our patients whom get a corneal transplant can be an ambassador if you can motivate them to motivate at least 10 or 15 people each of them that itself will be a good awareness uh, uh, program and the second important thing is whenever there is awareness program we see increase in the number of corneal donations we get it to the hospital but it is only for a short duration i think that needs to be a sustainable pattern okay. so like during this two weeks we had many number of corneal trans uh, uh, do uh, donations which we got but if it had to be a sustain it can't be just only two weeks we should have it at regular intervals so that these awareness programs are continued for a longer time thank you Thank you, Dr. Sudhir. Now we're almost at the end. Can we? Can I ask Dr. Vivek, please? Dr. Vivek's hands is up. Thank you. So I would like to uh, thank you. I would like to address one more thing, like which was our experience when we used the RAB6 methodology for the National Blindness Survey. While it is very well geared towards cataract, as we know that corneal causes of blindness are increasing in proportion, and the current survey methodology does not allow us to differentiate whether the corneal blindness was on account of say post cataract surgery or trauma. So some modification may be of this, you know, widely used research survey methodology that can bring some more light onto this matter. Maybe, you know, something to think about as we go forward. Just wanted to point that out. Yes. Yes, because uh, when uh, they developed RAP, the the diabetic retina, diabetes section was not there, and they added up now diabetes. Maybe they can add something so that even in doing the RAP, corneal uh, blindness can be uh, found out what the uh, what the situation is. Yes, I I I, I agree. So. Um, I, I think at the end, even though we did not speak so much about the prevention, but prevention is the most important thing in the corneal blindness. And we all have to, what I think is we have not been able to uh, use the evidence we have already from those big studies like MP Upadhyay's study and then uh, Dr. Srinivasan's study, all those evidences are there, but we have not been able to use those evidences to prevent the corneal blindness, or corneal infection, and subsequently corneal blindness in our region. I thank you so much. I thank all the uh, panelists, all the um, presenters, um, Rose and Russell and YD for, for um, supporting us to conduct this webinar and all the audiences. Thank you so much. <laughs>